So earlier we saw that uh, we saw basically how to navigate this uh, quite big data structure that we took for the virus. And now that we understand the data structure, we can do so all kinds of analysis on it, like we can do with any data that we get. So now it's basically just Python objects that we know how to work with. And for example, we can iterate through all the coding regions and collect all the product names into a list and get a list of basically all the 77 product names in that viral uh, genome. Now let's see an ex another example of a little bit more complex analysis that we can make. So here what we want to do is to break down all the, all the proteins uh, within this viral genome into three categories. So we know that each uh, virus has some capsid proteins which make up its capsid and likewise it has also membrane and envelopes which are more layers to the protein and these names occur within many proteins. So we basically we take all the protein whose name contains either envelope or membrane or, or capsid and then we can col collect all kinds of statistics about them. Here we take the ge genome lengths and we basically just calculate the average length of each of these categories. So let's see how it works. Uh, we initialize this dictionary which for each one of these three keywords uh, we start with an empty list and then we start with another fourth list with, uh, that would correspond to all the proteins. And now for each coding region, we take the product and convert it to lowercase. And we take the length of the translation, which is basically the protein length. And now we iterate through these three different categories. Each one, uh, we take the name and the corresponding list. And if this group name, either envelope, membrane, or capsid, is a substring of the product name, that, namely whether the, if the product name contains this uh, keyword, then we put it in the corresponding list. Uh, and we add it to the list, and then no matter what, we add it to the all lengths list. And then we take this list and we tuck it back into the dictionary under the category of all. And now we can iterate through them and print uh, the statistics that we get. So we see that overall we have 77 proteins whose average length is about 550. And we have seven capsid proteins, which are uh, more or less the same size. The envelope proteins from which we have 14 are somewhat shorter on average. And the five membrane proteins are much smaller on average. Okay, so we created now this yet another uh, data structures, which for each group gives us the lengths of all uh, the proteins of these, uh, of these categories. So it's basically just a dictionary uh, with uh, strings mapping to lists of numbers. Now if we want, we can take this new data structure and save it as a JSON file. So like we read a JSON, it's also very convenient, very easy to write a JSON. So like with files, we just open some pi file path, uh, which hopefully won't exist because otherwise it will overwrite it. And we take the writing mode. And now instead of using j JSON load, we use JSON dump and we give the object that we want to write and the file handler. And of course, we make sure to close the file. And once we run that, we should get this new JSON file. And I can open it. And you can see that everything is written in JSON formats. Um, yeah. So of course, when I give an object, it has to be some object that is convertible to JSON. So not everything in Python can be stored and saved into JSON. Classically, the kind of object which can be turned into JSON is just anything that is comprised of the kind of data types that I showed you. So it can have numbers, strings, booleans, nulls, lists, and dictionaries. These are the building blocks from which any object uh, that is made of can be written into a JSON file. There is a way to enrich this functionality and you can write your own uh, JSON extension, extensions which will take other objects and save them as JSON, but typically you don't want to do that and uh, we won't show it here. 
Uh, you can, likewise, you can extend uh, the JSON parser with your own parsers. But again, it's not very common that you will want to do that. So we saw how we can read JSONs from file and how we can write them uh, into files. Sometimes it happens that we want maybe to read uh, and to parse something at the JSON, but it's not actually within a file. Maybe we got it from somewhere else. Maybe it was only part of a file. Maybe it was within some other formats. And sometimes you can, for example, see that you have a CSV file whose parts of the values are in turn JSON. So you have some um, structure which is more complex. You have one format within another. Or maybe you took this JSON from some website and you didn't strictly read it from a file. So it could happen that you want to parse some, some JSON string that you just have it in memory as a string. You don't actually have a file with uh, the content. So if you want to take just a string and to, um, and to parse it or to write it, instead of the load s and the dump s, sorry, instead of the load and up, you have the load s and dump s which uh, will give you this functionality. So the load s will, um, will take a string and give you some objects, and the dump s will take, uh, will take some object and will give you back a string. So here, here, for example, you can see that using this function, we give the object, and now instead of providing it a file handler, we just give the object, and we get back some uh, variable, which we call row JSON, and you, you can see that it's actually just a string. So it turned this object into a JSON string that I can print on the screen. And you can see it's a, the exact same content uh, that I got when I served it, saved it into a file. And when I use the load as function, I again give it just a string that I created earlier. And this will parse it and give me the dictionary object, um, which is what I began with. Any questions about JSON format? So, the load and the dump will be given to just one physical unit and an STR. The output is an STR and the other one is just stored in the database? Yeah. So, instead of input or output as files, it's an input and output as strings. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, let's turn to parsing CSV files. So for this example, I will take the gene code, uh, which Michal showed you uh, in the previous lesson. So if we go to this website, uh, you can see some download page within uh, the gene code website. You can also go to it to the gene code and go to, to download the human, uh, the human annotations with uh, release 29, which corresponds to version 37 of the reference genome. So this is the older version. And then you can get all kinds of uh, files in all kinds of formats, which contain uh, all kinds of, of annotations. Uh, we will take the comprehensive gene annotation and we'll download it in the GTF formats. Uh, I won't save it now because I already downloaded it, but I put it here. And the thing to understand about this GTF format is that it's actually nothing more than a CSV with a tab delimited, delimiter. So it's actually a TSV file. So let's go back to the notebook. Okay, so I have this GTF format, but it's then I have another suffix of the GZ uh, suffix, which stands for uh, GZIP, uh, which is some kind of compression um, algorithm. It's like the, G, the ZIP or the RAR, uh, which is very often used. So the GZ is also a very common one. The nice thing about this uh, compression format is that you don't actually have to extract the files to work with it you can actually read them on the fly. So it's some kind of d dynamic uh, compression algorithm that let, lets you uh, read it in chunks if you want. And Python actually supports this uh, format. It has a gzip uh, library. 
uh, which can handle GZ uh, files just pretty much with the, the same interface that uh, you can open uh, regular text files. So, so instead of using the global open function, we use the gzip open function, which behaves the same way. We give it the path of the gz file, and we give the mode, and then we can just read. So here we read, we don't want to read any, everything because it's quite a large file. We read just the first uh, 1,000 characters. And now when you look at the content, you can actually uh, see for yourself what I said, that it's nothing more than a tab delimited file. So you have some kind of meta description lines, which begin with a hash, a double hash here. And then you have the actual content of the file, and you can see some values separated by tabs, um, which contain the gene annotations downloaded from the gene code. Uh, before we move to working with this CSV file, I first uh, wanted to give you a quick uh, warning about the gzip, which is very similar to the standard open function, but it do does behave a little bit differently in, in some aspects. So you can note that here when I uh, stated the mode, I didn't just put an R like I typically do, I also put a T here, which means I want it in the text mode. If I didn't put this T, I would get something a little bit different. You can see that now it looks a little bit more messy. And if you're an observant person, you can t see that it actually begins with a small b here, uh, which indicates that the output you see here is not actually a string. If I checked its, its type, you would see that it's actually a binary uh, kind of output. So that's a distinction between gzip and the standard open, whereas the standard open will by default give me everything in text mode. When I use a gzip, I need to explicitly state that I want the text mode, and otherwise it will give me it in binary mode. And when I use some downstream parsers, like CSV parsing, uh, if I forget to add this uh, T mode, then it might not work for me. So, so make sure that you put it if you want to read everything in, in text mode. Okay, so the gzip aside, now let's see how we can uh, import the CSV module to parse this uh, CSV file. So again, I open it using the gzip module, and now I use the CSV reader function to provide it a file handler, handler which I created. And because it's a tab delimited and not a comma delimited, I need to explicitly state which character is the delimiter. So I put a backslash T, meaning the, the tab uh, character, uh, because the default again is, is a comma. And I read it and I get some object, which I call a CSV reader. And the CSV reader is something which we call an iterator. Uh, you will hear more about the iterator in an upcoming uh, bonus question. Uh, but for now, we'll just say that the iterator is everything that you can iterate on, and you have some function in Python, which is called next, which gives you the next object of each iterator that you have. In the case of the sysv reader, the kind of objects it iterates through are the different rows uh, within the CSV file. So the reason I do this next five times without actually doing anything with what it gives is because, as you can see here, um, the gene code annotation file, it starts with five uh, meta description lines, which I don't care about, so I just iterate through them. And only once I've done that, I can, again, iterate 100 times, and then I collect the first 100 uh, lines into these annotations list. And you can see that I end up with a list with, as expected, 100 elements. And if I print the first five elements, I can see that each one of the elements within the list is itself uh, a list which contains all the values that were separated by tabs. So I just get the values. So what the CSV parsing basically gives me is just a list of lists of strings uh, with all the values within the file.
Now, of course, in a typical analysis, I will not only want to go through just the first 100 lines, I will want to go through all the, all the lines. And for that, I do not need to use the next function. I can just iterate it uh, using a for loop. So if I do something like for line in CSV reader, it will just give me all the lines, where each line, again, is a list of strings. OK, so now let's see some code that uh, does some parsing of this data and extracts some, um, some genes that we might care about. <laughs> if we go back to the gene code page, um, where is it? Yeah, there is some documentation, I think maybe the data format. Yeah, here you have it. OK, so it has some documentation of the GTF uh, format. Because the file itself doesn't contain headers, um, you do not know what, what each of the values uh, stand for. But here you have some description which explains. So you can see for each column what its content is. And it gives you some examples. And you have very nice um, explanation of the format. So you can read it and understand how to uh, interpret and to parse it. Uh, so it has nine different uh, fields. So if we want to iterate through the annotations, we need the for loop, which in this case we, we assign it to nine different variables. Uh, some of them we don't care about, so we just put an underscore. Uh, but there are five variables that we do care about, and these are the, the chromosome, uh, the type of the annotation, its start and end coordinates on the chromosome, and some extra fields. Uh, which we store into this variable. Now, for this example, we only care about genes, so we compare the type to a gene. And if that is a gene, I use some helper function that I wrote here, which is called parse extra fields. I will soon show you how it works. Uh, but basically, it takes this, um, where is it? Uh, it's the last value within each line. Uh, yeah, here. You can see all of these is just extra fields that you have for each annotation depending on its type. And again, you can see that it's some sort of a key value pairing. You can see some uh, gene ID field, and, th and then a space, and then its value, and then you have a semicolon, and then transcript ID and its value, and so on. So I basically just parse it into a dictionary of strings. Uh, which is called the extra fields, and then I append it into the genes uh, list that I created, and I store just the gene name, which I extract from the extra fields, and then the gene type, and the chromosome, and the end, uh, start and end uh, coordinates. So within the first 100 annotations, there are 10 genes, and you can see the details of these genes here. Um, beginning, of course, from the first uh, chromosome. So this parse extra fields function, again, is quite simple. I just take this row extra fields. And I take everything but the last character, because I think it ends with a semicolon that I do not want. And then I split it by a semicolon to split all the different uh, entries within it. And then each entry, I strip it away from um, from trading uh, spaces, and then I split it by a space, OK, because its key value pairing is uh, separated by space. And I store them into the key and the row value. And then I take the row value and strip it away from any quotation marks uh, to get the actual value, and I store it into the dictionary, and then I return the dictionary. Any questions about uh, this uh, parsing code? OK. Uh, and now finally, once I have all I wanted, so I took the data, uh, I manipulated it a little bit, and I created my own data structure of genes. And you can note that the data structure I created is, again, a list of lists. So I won't, may want to, again, store it as a CSV file. Uh, and I can actually do that. So to create my own CSV file, again, I use the open function, provide some file path, 
with write writing mode. And this new line uh, equals empty string, which is actually important because by default it is uh, a new line. And this is where writer then has its own new line. So what happens if I do not use this new line is that for every line I create, it creates its own empty line in between and I might get uh, some extra empty lines in between each two lines. So this is actually important. And then I take this file and convert it, turn it into a CSV writer using the CSV writer function. And then the CSV writer uh, object has some write rows function, which uh, can take a bunch of rows and write them all together at the same time. So it expects to get a list of lists. And whatever is, is in within this list is converts to strings and saves them as a CSV file. So once I run that, I end up getting, you can see a new genes CSV file. And if I open it, you see everything I stored. So I get, sorry, I get um, the gene symbols and the gene names and the chromosome and the start and then coordinate of each of the 10 genes uh, that I parsed. Yeah. Um, yeah, some more, more important uh, things you can do. So we use the right rows uh, to write many rows at the same time, but like, like the right rows, there is uh, another function which is called the right row in singular, which takes one row at a time. So just a, a list, and you can write each row separately if you want, or you can write many rows and then some separate rows. You can do it however you want. Any final questions about uh, JSON, CSV? <coughs> okay, so uh, let's turn into another topic. So I also wanted to talk about, <coughs> sorry, uh, what is called functional programming? So the idea behind functional programming is, uh, like I already showed you, again, in previous lessons, functions in Python behave pretty much like any other object. You can pass them around and give and create some functions which use other functions to do all kinds of, of manipulations. And if you take this idea and extend it uh, even further, you get this uh, programming paradigm that you can have all kinds of functions as building blocks of some complex um, of some complex uh, data processing, and then you can take these building blocks and combine them in all kinds of, of ways. So this is the idea of functional programming. So, so today I'm going to show you a little bit what you can do with this kind of concept of using functions as building blocks and then using other functions which take uh, those functions and use them in predefined way to, to modify uh, the kind of behavior that you want to get. So we'll begin with uh, something a bit technical which is called the lambda or sometimes anonymous functions. So let's see what it is. So like I showed you in the previous lesson, we can define a function uh, using the def statement. So just a def followed by the function name and then the content of the function. And we get some function which we can then invoke and use as many times as we want. So that's the classic way of defining a function. Uh, but it turns out that Python supports another way to defining function using the lambda statement. So in the lambda statement, uh, we do not have to specify right away the name of the function. <coughs> Sorry. Rather, what we do, we just take the arguments followed by a column, and then on, on the very same line, we specify the output that we want the function to produce. And if we want, we can take what we created and, and store it into a variable called f. So f is a function that maps x to the square of x. And we can invoke it the same way uh, that, that we, we did in, in the previous example. And we basically get the same thing. We get the same kind of function 
that calculates the square of each number. Now, an interesting thing about this lambda function is uh, that you do not actually have to give it a name. Uh, and that's the reason why it's sometimes called an anonymous function. We can actually define it and use it uh, right away within the same line without specifying its name. So you can make it some one-time uh, use function. So here in this example, we define a function. And then we invoke it right away using the parentheses. And this basically just takes uh, the argument 5, passes it to the argument of the function, and calculates the output. And the lambda function can even get more than one argument. We can take, say, two arguments, separated by a comma, and invoke it with two arguments, and we get what we expect. Now, at this point, if you have never seen lambda functions before, you might wonder <laughs> what's the point. I mean, why would I want to define a function and then use it within the same line? I mean, if I wanted to calculate the sum of 1 and 2, I could just calculate the sum of 1 and 2, and it would make the exact same thing. Why do I need to, to create this silly function to do that? And the answer is uh, that this, this actually relates to uh, the concept, which I showed you on the previous uh, lesson, of using functions as the input of other functions. So let's see a quick example. So suppose we want to define this function, which we call isValidSec, which takes a sequence and validates it. And the way it validates uh, the sequence, it takes another function which validates just one letter at a time and then basically goes uh, through all the letters in the sequence and validates them using this function. And if it's not valid, it returns false. And if it didn't find any invalid letter, then it returns true, uh, indicating that it is, in fact, a valid uh, sequence. Now, if we want to use this function uh, with some one-letter uh, validating function that we create, in the old way, we would have to actually uh, define a new function using the def statement, which would probably take a few lines of code. We'd have to give it a name. And it might be a little bit cumbersome to do that. Now, if we use the lambda functions, on the other hand, we can just uh, basically define the function that we want and pass it as an argument all within the same line. So you can see here I have two calls to this function with the same DNA sequence. But each time I provided to it a different function. The first time I provided a function that checks uh, whether it's a DNA nucleotide, and the second time whether it's an RNA nucleotide. And as expected, you can see that it is, in fact, a valid DNA sequence, but not a valid RNA sequence. So that, that illustrates kind of the point of why I would want to use this lambda syntax. That's a neat way, actually, to, to provide uh, a function that I define on the spot into another function uh, without needing to create my own function and deciding what name to give it, just specifying the logic that I want and create this function that I use just once. Another case it might be useful if you remember, again, in the previous lesson, I showed you how we can sort a list and we saw that we can use the key function to provide sorry, the key argument to provide a function that would determine the sorting uh, mechanism. And we saw that if we wanted our own logic, we uh, would have to uh, give some function input. And here you, here you can see that, for example, if we have a list of pairs and we want to compare them by the difference between the first and the second element uh, within each pair, then again, we can do it just within one line by using the lambda function which gets a pair as an input and gives the difference as an output. And then this function will be used as a key for the sorting. And it will indeed sort everything from uh, the lowest to the highest uh, difference. Questions about the lambda functions? Uh, no, th they can actually be as long as you want, but 
Uh, as a rule of thumb, if you want a very long function, then I wouldn't recommend you to do it as a lambda function because it would be very unreadable. So it does have to be one line. I mean, Python doesn't restrict uh, the length of the lines you create, but it's not a good idea to create lines uh, that are, say, uh, 1,000 letters long because uh, it would be very difficult to navigate it. So, so yeah, it's, it's a very powerful method, but you need to be careful not to abuse it and, and use it too far. Sometimes it is better just to define a function and, and, and take your code and make it multiple lines and not just one line. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's the that's the syntax. Yeah, it has to. Yeah. Like typically, if you want a function that doesn't return an output but actually does something, then it's not a good idea to use a lambda function. Lambda function is 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 expected to to be a function that gets an input and produces some output. It's also not considered. It's considered a very bad practice. And not just with lambda function, but generally to have functions that have what it's called side effects. So if you have a function that other than getting an input, calculating something and creating an output, on top of that, it also changes something in the environment. It makes some, it has some global statements which take some something and changes it. Sometimes we want to do that if it's by design, but most of the time, it's not what people expect when they use functions. So when you use a function, you do not expect it to have some side effects that affect the global environment. Uh, so if you do have side effects and it's by design, you might want to indicate it very clearly in the function name or maybe add some uh, documentation to the function stating that this is actually what you want. Uh, with the Lambda function, it's even more <laughs> not, not costumed to do that. So it, it, the whole concept of functional programming is that you have some blocks with input and output, but that they do not have all kinds of side effects. So if you have side effects, it sort of breaks uh, this paradigm and uh, makes everything much more complex. So basically, you want to avoid that. L let's now see more examples of where these uh, functional programming paradigms could become handy. So. Let's say, for example, that we have a list of numbers and we want to filter uh, and create a list that contains just, uh, say, the positive numbers within this list. So up until now, if you wanted to do, th do that, there would be nowhere, no way around uh, using some kind of a for loop. So we'll have to create this empty list and then iterate through all of the elements in the list and compare them to zero, making sure that they are indeed positive. And only if it's positive, we append it to, um, to this list, and then we get the list with just the positive numbers. So many lines of code just to do something as simple as filtering elements. Now it turns out Python provides us a, a quick way to do filtering using the filter function. Now what the filter function does, it gets some function and it gets a list or any sequence of elements and it will return you a sequence of elements with just the functions, sorry, just the elements where this function returns true. So this function is expected to be a function that gets as input elements within the list and returns either true or false depending on whether you want or do not want them in your filtered list. And then it just does the filtering and give you the same outputs. And also note that we convert it to a list because by default it creates some other data type which is called uh, a generator, uh, which again will be explained in an upcoming uh, bonus question. Uh, but for now just know that you need to convert it into a list. So another example, now suppose we want to create a list or maybe a string with all the digits between one to nine, but we do not want them as integers, we want them as strings. So again, if we want to get some sequence, say range 10, and then manipulate each one of those elements in a predefined way, 
up until now, there was no way around using, again, this for loop and creating this list and then converting each digit into a string and appending it to the list. And then we might maybe want to use the join function to just turn it into one long string. Uh, but again, it turns out that Python provides us with a more convenient way to do that using the map function, which like the filter function gets a function and some sequence. And what the map will do, it will basically just apply, which will invoke this function on each one of the elements uh, separately and return to you a new, se a new sequence with uh, the manipulated elements that you get. So by using the str as a function, if you remember, it's, it's the type can be used as a function that converts something to a string. You can apply the str conversion on, on all the digits using the map, and you will end up getting the same output. Now we can even uh, combine them. Uh, no, sorry, here what I wanted to show. Okay, here, here's just another uh, example. Uh, so here I use the lambda syntax. So you can see, I again give it all the digits between zero and nine, and I define a function that calculates the square of each number, and you can see the square of everything within this uh, range. Here? Yeah. Uh, ju just to spare me the need to, to write many lines of code of initializing a list and then to iterate through that and then to append and you know all that. I will later show you an even more easy way to do that, but for now I think it's the simplest way uh, we've seen so far. Uh, here is another example. So, here what happens uh, is, you can see here a code example that calculates the reverse complement of a given DNA sequence. Now if you remember from your exercises, it's something that uh, took a little bit of, of effort and writing some lines of code, so you need to reverse the string and then to find a complement of each letter and to create a new string, etc. cetera. Uh, here you can see that I can actually do that in just one line of code if I predefine a dictionary uh, called a complement that maps each nucleotide to its complement. So let's see how it works. First, I take the DNA sequence and using the slicing notation that I showed you in the past, I can reverse its order to calculate the reverse of this string. And then I use the complement get function. So this is the get function of the complement. If you remember, the get function of a dictionary is a function that for each key will give you its value. Okay, so this is a function that for each nucleotide will give me its complement. And now if I use the map of this function, it will give me the complement of each nucleotide within the sequence. And what the map will end up giving me is a sequence of the complement of the nucleotide in reversed order, and then I just need to use the join function to turn everything into a string again, and what I get is the reverse complement of, of the sequence that I began with. Questions? The map returns a list? N no, it doesn't return a list, it returns uh, a generator. So again, it's something that will be explained I think in the next, next uh, bonus question. But it's something that you can very easily convert into a list if you want. So the join is not only a join works on any sequence. Uh, so yeah, it applies to, to what maps give you as well. So ba basically anything that supports the, the next function that you can iterate on uh, is a valid input for all of, the, all of those functions. 